quite a lot of, of say, the philosophy of science literature stimulating and interesting and, and perhaps I have a combination of reading some of that basic philosophical philosophy of science literature combined with computational social science very far apart from each other but always that's what we have to merge together I think for the future. Welcome, Peter, to the Journeys of Scholars. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, Peter. It's good, great Thank to have you, you <laughs> on, on the show. So, so this conversation is, is going to be about um, the trajectories, the micro, macro strategies and habits and different types of you know, behavior choices that uh, scholars, uh, top scholars, top class academic performance have, have conducted. And so this is really just a sort of a fireside chat uh, type of conversation. Sounds fun. So, Peter, you are um, the founder of the Institute for Analytical Sociology at Lean Shipping, Lean Shipping University. You are previously also the director of the Institute. Uh, you are currently this, uh, one of the senior research fellows at Nuffield College at Oxford. Uh, you are also fellow of the uh, Royal Swedish Academy uh, of Sciences and also the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, History and Antiquities and also the Norwegian uh, Academy of Sciences and Letters. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's uh, a bit of, of, of your positions. And you have also, um, or are, uh, I would say, uh, one of the driving forces that behind analytical sociology and also now uh, computational social science, particularly within the field of, uh, of sociology. And you've written numerous articles, books uh, on the topic. Uh, you've had uh, many plenary speak speaking opportunities to, to uh, highlight the topic and also sort of drive it in different directions. Recipient of numerous awards, obviously. One of them, the, the, the James Coleman uh, Book Award uh, from the uh, American Sociological Association uh, for your book, the Dissecting the Social. So, so many fine uh, medals <laughs> on, on, on your back, obviously. And so you have had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of on this, on this path of, of going from, you know, sort of, this solo uh, building of, of sociology into building uh, something something different. So, uh, actually, one of the you know, uh, although I've had um, you know read your book back in the days and many of your books uh, with Richard as well, Richard Sved Burke uh, on social mechanisms. Uh, our first meeting was, uh, I believe, in two thousand seventeen. It was. I'm not sure uh, if you uh, uh, recall that, but that was at a workshop with the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, History, and Antiquities. Uh, and so during that uh, during that workshop, um, uh, one of the you know one of the big questions that that hit me that you know here we have Peter, one of the uh, founding uh, fathers, if you like, of analytical sociology and really one of the drivers uh, in, in that field. And uh, and so that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, also uh, a a successful um, sort of research environment starter, a builder, uh, right? So building research environments. Uh, the Institute for Analytical Sociology is perhaps one of the, uh, you know, one of the clearest examples, but also the director of the Institute for Studies and so on and so forth. So we have, you know, we have this sort of image of a, uh, a person that really drives his own agenda, research agenda. And then we have the image of a, you know, a, 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 perhaps a, a manager or managing director. And so how do you, you, know, how do you balance these two uh, personas, if you like? Uh. Well, in part, I think that say, <clears throat> the two sides have been taking up more, I mean, at certain ages, uh, one of the side has been the dominant, at other times the, 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 the other one has dominated. So, um, but I think I've always been interested in, in uh, building environments around me. And, and of course I became full professor at, at a very, very young age. I started out after Harvard, I started out as an assistant professor at Chicago. And then already at my, my second year at, at Chicago, I was offered a, a full professorship at Stockholm University. Right. Okay. Uh, and then 
became dean of the department. Oh, sorry, uh, chair of the department sure, okay. mm. a year later. Mm. And it was a t- tough time for the department. I mean, I think it just needed a push. So mm. I came in as a what was I, 34 year old, I think. And I oh, was wow. going to push, push the other <laughs> senior people around. And, and, um, so I think already then it, it I had that side in me. I don't, don't right. know where it came from, but but um, then I had a long period, particularly at, at Oxford, I would say, at Arthur mm. College, uh, that allowed me to absolutely no building, not, nothing but just reading and thinking and writing. Right. And, um, so those two different sides have, have as I said, dominated a different different parts of my career right. probably more of the building gradually the older i have become i would say <laughs> right 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 more way toward the, toward the building so, so this is really fascinating because i mean you have um i mean it's at least in these you know sort of leadership books or maybe leadership advice is often that you have these uh two uh, characteristics of or two personas of individuals sort of either building or or being a solo you know writing but, but you have been able to switch between them, which is quite unique, as, as you said, also at young age, at 34. Yeah. Just, like, do you have a special switch or like, how does it work? Like, what walks through that, that, that switching of, of mentality? And probably I have always seen it as a time delimited project in some ways, but mm. going into being chair uh, at Stockholm, I mean, I saw it as a, three, four year mm. um, project that I was doing to get the, to help getting the department on the right track. Mm. I didn't see it as a career choice. Awesome. But I, I didn't want to build a career in, in right. an, an administrative academic career. Mm. Mm. Um, I guess we come back to that later, but I mean, at one point I was considering it and, and became dean at in Singapore for a year. Yeah, but, I was going to say, exactly. Then, then if I had stayed there, that would, of course, have been a true yeah. career fork and going fully administrative, but, but that right. did not happen. So. so this is really interesting. And we can maybe stay on this this topic a little bit, uh, Peter, because this is also a critical point in, in academia in general where, um, you know, we, we train young uh, scholars, you know, through the PhD program, through a postdoc, assistant, associate, and then full. And then um, we have this aspiration for them to, to become, you know, take some leadership positions. Uh, and, and then you have, you know, you have at least two paths. One, leadership through academic work. You, you lead, as you have done very much in your analytical sociology track, right? Leadership through doing uh, important work. Uh, and then you have leadership through institutional uh, leadership. And so... And this is also it's very interesting because you have then also that, but also the contrast of, say, Anglo-Saxon leadership versus Anglo-Saxon leadership, say, in Scandinavia. Sorry, Scandinavian versus Anglo-Saxon leadership. And so they might be quite different where here it seems like, you know, you could, that's a career path that you choose to stay on. Whereas in the U.S., it's a career path you, uh, as you were hinting, basically, that this is like a limited position and it's something you contribute to build a, a strong research environment. So... What, like, what's the, um, the benefits uh, bet- between, say, the Anglo-Saxon type of uh, leadership positions versus the Scandinavian ones? Uh, I'm not sure if, if we think of the terms in the same way, but, but I think, um, of course, already at the chair level in the United States, at least it used to be the case, I'd perhaps not quite as much anymore but, mm. but course, certain people became professional department chairs and, and, and they right. could be excellent at it and it cost of course a lot of research time so, so if they had been chaired too long I mean then they um, of course yeah I mean the, the um, their influence on, on others through their academic work declined gradually right right um, but of course, if you move, and, and there I think in, in the Swedish system, at least on that 
departmental side, and there is much more of a turnaround on who, who takes yeah. on these positions. But of course, if you move up to the dean's level, right. you're already, uh, once you take that step in Sweden or elsewhere, you, you're really, yeah. you're a full-time administrator. It's very, very difficult uh, right, right. To, to do anything but administrating. But, uh, but, yeah. but of course, I think also, I mean, I think in my career, I mean, that perhaps I've had most influence on others. I mean, because you have scholarship, you have kind of um, building institutions, but you also have kind of like mini institutions that are very easy to build. I mean, so, so this international network of analytical sociology that now holds annual conferences as an um, we were in Florence now. Right, yeah. This year is going to be in Princeton next year. Uh, I think has been very important, mm -hmm. and and of course there I, I I'm the one who started it once, but then it has its own life, and I think that has been very important for. So sometimes if you're lucky, you can invest a little bit of your time to start up a process that yeah. then you can let it go or right. let. M much of it go and uh, it turn, turns out to be very important for, for particularly for younger people I think who, um, who often needs have the need to have an, being able to state their identity I am a, right. of course for some it has become an analytical sociologist right. which is a label that didn't exist mm -hmm. before and uh, and of course, it's with some pleasure I go to this Enas and I see all the things. That, well, but if that had been for me, then this probably would never have happened. It would have been something else, perhaps. But uh, I mean, that, that's a personal satisfaction. Right. I mean, you can get out of um, some work that, that yeah. I mean, where you really notice that you have had an impact, which is right. very, very satisfying personally, I think. Well, that was, you know, that was, uh, I mean, so many, several questions coming up in my, in my mind right now. One, one is, you know, this, this question of what, what's driving you to, you know, uh, go into these leadership positions. And you're saying what, one is obviously personal uh, satisfaction. And ha have you, like, is there any other drivers? And also, are, are there any sort of costs related, you know, except for time, obviously? Um, I mean, obviously, one... I mean, I've always thought to some extent that um, being, a, being a good academic has a lot in common with being an entrepreneur in some ways. Mm. And you, you, you have to be somewhat creative, you have to be, believe in your ideas, and you really have to go for it and build things. And... And a little bit, you can get the same rewards as I think you can get from perhaps not the financial rewards that you can get from a successful regular entrepreneurship. But I mean, you can get much of the other stimulation of, of you know, that comes with yeah. being creative or creating things and, and um, So that now, now I mean, forgot that what you asked me about exactly, but, but um, well, ba basically, you know, the, the satisfaction it's, it's, driven, it's driven by some kind of personal yeah. satisfaction in 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 creating things. Of course, it's also partly that you do these things because you you believe you're doing something good for others or for the discipline or something like that. That, that I mean, it's a, well. You have to sacrifice a bit of yourself, but you do it for the for the common good, which is then the discipline that, that, that you're part of. Um, I think also at some point, um, which I guess will come to later, um, building things like that. Uh, Sounds a bit silly, perhaps, and very personal, but uh, 
a bit existential uh, in right. the sense that, that once you stop working, yeah. uh, you want to leave something behind that, that uh, uh, continues to live. I mean, if you have spent your entire life working incredibly hard in your work life, yeah. and then when you're gone, there's nothing left of you. Right. That feels... Uh, if you create things like, like an institute or whatever and, and that survives and thrives after you're gone, I mean, that, that's also, right. uh, once again, on a very personal level, something uh, satisfying. It's, it's almost like, you know, I mean, in a way, scholarship is that we are, we are writing, you know, articles, books, they, they live their own life by, by existing outside of us. You know, you publish yeah. it, you can't do anything about it. You can critique it, you can, others can read it, and so on, you can build on it. Uh, but this, is, this sounds like is another way of creating, another way of sustaining things that is more uh, material. So the, you know, the book is material, obviously, it exists, no, no, but it's, no. but it's on, the, on the sort of platonic level, it's an idea that exists. But an institute, uh, you know, it, it, it really, you know, you say it thrives, it flourishes, it keeps on existing. Uh, either like uh, either like some type of institute or say some kind of organization like ENAS or right. I mean that that of course will not have eternal lives but no. That, no. Uh, but of course you're right if you if you write books or articles that that, that uh, survive through time that that is of course very much the same. Uh, hmm. Now I think when one looks back, I mean, of course, there are very few things that, I mean, uh, that survive the test of time. Yeah. I mean, we, and which is good in many ways, because it means that our thinking, our research develops and so on. I think scholars and hmm. single pieces of research published earlier that one thought of as, as incredibly important. Right. Their importance becomes purely of historical value. It, it has no, no impact really on what's going on in the present. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's part of, in a way, um, thinking about life in general. It's, it's like, you know, you, you, you're born, you, you, you know, you, you, right. mature, you, you, know, you, you, you might marry, you might get kids yeah. and, you know, you, and, and through memories, through sort of uh, 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 interactions, you have impact. And then on the, on the lives of, of, of your children, your friends, your family, and they have on you. And then, you know, that might, that might uh, you know, after your death, sort of uh, your memory sort of stays or, or have its sort of influence on their lives in different ways. And this is like intellectual life, right? <laughs> where, where it has a similar type of process, obviously, but it's different, uh, different in character. Also, I mean, if you think upon sociology, I think, of course, we have our classics hmm. far back. I mean, that people still read, I mean, perhaps not as much as we did, but, but, but they, they still are, are alive and read. Yeah. Uh, if you take what's published from I don't know, 1930 to 1990. Mm. Um, there are, I mean, I think the, the, the longevity of, of even the important uh, books is fairly short. Right. Uh, and uh, I, don't, yeah, I mean, even big, I mean, I remember I met. Harriet Zuckerman, who was married to, to Robert K. Merton. And she complained, I think rightly so, that, that well, no one reads Merton anymore. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of dead. I mean, sometimes one remembers yeah. uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy or, or the Matthew effect. But he's not uh, uh, someone who is actively studied today, and, and probably for very good reasons. Right. But, but still, that, that uh, even those who were giants of the field once declined very, very quickly. And I think I know it was the same with, I mean, it was very much Coleman who brought me to Chicago. And of course, then I think, I thought that he was on the height of his career then when right. he was... Um, 
now my sense is that no one remembers mm. Coleman, the mathematical sociologist, or, or say outside of very strict rational choice circles, no one remembers the theorist mm. Coleman. Now it's Coleman, the, the, the school researcher who is remembered. Uh, and in, in which I think was mm. timely work at the time it was published, but of course, there's not no great sociology in, in his yeah. in his school books uh, of, of the kind. And so so I think that the the people must have studied that, I guess, the rate at which uh, citations decline yeah. over time. Uh, there's there's this process of um, what we're describing right now, that the the discipline or or you know the the active sort of conversation of the discipline uh, moving on letting you know letting other sort of classics be or, or, or finding new classics and so on mm -hmm. and so forth so it's a at a personal level Peter it's like the same thing like letting go is part of the of the process and you mentioned you know you mentioned uh, building for example you know um, uh, Inas and IS as a founding director you know at some point you you you, you reach a point of saying now I'm letting go what, what's the what's the what's the, like the decision-making process in your mind of when the timing of letting go? Yeah. Probably it. I would think that it depends on the activity. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes, um, I mean, I think it's, I mean, in, in my case, it's just wanting to move on. I must have a very personal, some kind of restless side of me that wants to move on to, to something else. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the more you have invested in building the thing. Exactly, yeah. Uh, the more you want to make sure that it survives after uh -huh. you. Uh, so I mean, with the Institute for Analytical Sociology, of course, in the beginning, most of the Institute was funded by money that I had brought in. Mm. And, and I was worried for a while. I mean, what will happen the day that I mm. leave? Will it survive or not? And, and will it? And then, which, which of course has been a tremendous personal satisfaction to me is that, yes, it indeed seems to, and it's thriving. I mean, people like you, you there, and, and there are lots of people who, who uh, so it it so I think in that case I kind of let go of being director, mm. but I felt that now there is a sufficiently number of good people who will mm. run, and they will not do exactly as I would have done, mm. but it will be handled very well. Uh, mm. And then I think once someone steps in, you have to step out. Yeah. Because nothing, nothing worse than having the old boss look at <laughs> uh, But like being there as a yeah. discussion partner, yeah. uh, and, and when needed, a more of a mentor role, mm. but not ins insisting on having any influence or not mm. intervening mm. in any way without being called upon. Mm. So. Mm. Um, Yeah, so I think it, it um, uh, the less you have invested in something, the, the, the lesser reasons you need to, right. to move on, or the easier it is to move on, the quicker you have to move on. But um, Sure, so it's, it's a process. I mean, it sounds like you know, something that matures in you, and then you feel both this, I guess, uh, a drag for the new, there's a like a you know a driver that sort of wants you or your mind is wanting to find something new to work on, but also the old that you have the uh, the, the feeling of responsibility, but also the feeling of of as we all have not not wanting to let go before you know it, it actually will no, 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 fly fly. Yeah. And it's yeah, and is, 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 is all right. Go ahead. Oh yeah, no, no, and that that's not what I was going to say. It's not really just building, but I mean I remember that. Uh, 
when I went to, to Oxford from Stockholm, mm. uh, because these positions at Annapolis College really are like research professorships, so you don't have any duties at all, essentially, except for going to some meetings and lunches, and mm. you're allowed to teach if, if you want to teach, mm. but it's nothing required. Mm. But that enabled me, gave me just enormous amount of time to, to read, to think, to write, mm. which I really had in the past. And mm. I think it was wonderful, I probably was more productive than, than I ever were before or after. Right. But then at that time, you couldn't build things enough. I mean, it was like three groups. It was the economics group, politics, and sociology groups. Right. And there were lots of reasons for have, keeping them in parity, approximately, size-wise. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You don't want one of them growing too fast. Yeah. <laughs> so there was like, a, yeah, you couldn't do anything to change. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't suddenly start to... Research, new research output. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since I left, now things have changed. I think it's possible. Yeah. But then, and then my my desire to build things finally uh, came to mean that I, I decided to leave Oxford because I I felt the need to do yeah to yeah. build. Yeah. Which is actually an amazing decision if you think if you think like if you think about it from a from an, yes. <laughs> at least like from an outside you know yeah. <laughs> from an outside yeah. perspective yeah. and so I mean that must have been a, a like a, a very difficult decision like but maybe it wasn't but but it, from the outside it looks like it might, must have been. But the strange thing it it wasn't really I mean I think it was part partly I think also driven by family reasons that I fairly late in life in Oxford had a young daughter yeah. uh, and the prospect of, of having her growing up to Swede in Sweden was it was not the main driver of everything I did but that was one I mean so Sweden suddenly appeared yeah. more attractive. Hmm. Uh, then I didn't think I would find anything that could offer good hmm. enough terms to move back. Right. But then it, as you know, it came up. So I, I was director for something called the Institute for Future Studies right. for a few years. Hmm. But there I remember because at the same time I was affiliated with NYU in Abu Dhabi and right. uh, and I remember then that the dean there, Ivan Zellenji, who used to be in Madison at Yale before, when he introduced me when I was going to give a seminar, and he said that, uh, that I was at Oxford and I was now moving, moving to the Institute for Future Studies, and the whole audience started laughing. They thought <laughs> he was joking. <laughs> no, of course, yeah, it was a very unusual step. To, uh, That's a beautiful joke. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, I, I mean, I I like what you know. It, it's it says also I think something deeper about the, the the journeys of of different scholars, right? That that we are on different paths, we have different different goals, but also that we are embedded in, in a larger um, you know context of life. It's not only about academia itself. You you mentioned your daughter. You mentioned you know making decisions that is best for her and the family, but also decisions that are best. Optimally, so between those sort of dimensions that you were optimizing over your career, your daughter's life, and you know other uh, aspects, yeah. and that's something you know I, I myself have have sort of uh, thought about a lot in terms of uh, prospects in Sweden, prospects in the U.S. and you uh, uh, England, U.K. and uh, Germany, and so on and so forth. Um, and so it, it is, and I you know I came to the decision. Also, that Sweden is probably a, a very good place to to uh, to settle, at least for you know a good good amount of, of your life. And we are both Swedes, so <laughs> maybe we biased to some extent. But yeah. but um, you know, your advice to internationals when it comes to this, like that, ha having grown up in, in Sweden, and uh, the possibilities that you get, but also things that you forego. Uh, could, could you know what if you remember what those things were, but also new things that 
came up that you know may, that you have with you today that you could share? Can you take that again? I, uh, yeah, yeah. So there, are, there. Are, I mean, there are several several things going on, right? One is like, where should you settle? So this yeah. is Scandinavia, with you know, uh, basically with this welfare system allowing you know uh, uh, you as as a family to have a better uh, standard of life, I would say. But but that's not one. That's not the only thing. As as we academics aspiring to to mm -hmm. become better, pursuing excellence, and so if you would only probably optimize on one dimension, say how good I can be, maybe you maybe you wouldn't choose me, Sweden. Maybe you would. I, I don't know. No, but no, but, no, but no. you have many dimensions that no, you want. No, no. So what would be you know your logic of thinking here? No no no. So I think. For me, and, and, and I guess that probably is generally true. I mean, I think that the the younger you are, or the more junior you are, the more important is the depart the quality of the department and the university that you're attending. I mean, from from um, early on, I think. I mean, if you're, I mean, at the uh, well, I always think of it in terms of, of getting good advice from first from say, I mean, if you're a graduate student or something like that, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the difference between a really top rate university and uh, some more mediocre one. Mm -hmm. So of course, are you going to get the, the, well, there's reasons for why some faculty end up at mediocre universities and, and um, so the risk of you getting the wrong signals uh, yeah. is, of course, much greater at uh, yeah. local university than at an operated university. Mm -hmm. But steered in, in directions that will not help your career. I mean, that, that very likely you may end up in the same mm. um, type of universities. Mm. Um, and, and for me, I think that's, Stockholm University or most of Swedish universities in the uh, late 70s, mm -hmm. I mean, were the, the social science, they were pretty good. I mean, there could be lots of smart people there, but it was not the people were not driven. I mean, they were not. Um, they very much saw the academic work as an occupation rather than a vocation. Right. They, uh, they, it was a nine to five work. And then you, uh, and I remember then coming uh, to Harvard first as a, just as a year for you, being there as a visitor for a year. Mm. Because I, I worked as an assistant to a professor in Stockholm and, and mm. he, he arranged so I could go to 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 Harvard for a year. And that yeah. was and I was very skeptical about the value of going there. <laughs> but I was sort of colored by the period that, that yeah. I mean, it was still the area era of the Vietnam War and, and the United oh. States was not high in on, on the mind. And, and and of course I mean oh, yeah. anyway, God, oh, yeah, okay I can go. I mean right. Perhaps that's good. And, and of course, it was an enormous eye-opener for me. I mean, both, of course, what life in the United States, you know, the whole spectrum of the, the most wonderful, the most exciting to the most awful. And, but, yeah. but, 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 and particularly the, the uh, academic life, the people were, they re it really was, they lived their work in some yeah. ways. Yeah. People, students were bragging about the all-nighters they had done and <laughs> they were sitting up 24 hours <laughs> studying and, and, and at Stockholm at that time, if you happened to go to the office on a Saturday and it became known, you were kind of a bit strange. So I mean, it was a very, those, those cultural differences had disappeared yeah. more or less, I think. Right. But uh, so I think at that time, the fact that I came to Harvard fairly early, I think had a lot of influence on 
who I became. Right. Of course, the, the older, and I think also actually in the, when I moved back to Stockholm and became chair then of the Stockholm department, mm. I think it helped enormously. Of course, having a PhD from Harvard, having been yeah. at Chicago, and I think it helped particularly among those mm who couldn't judge the quality of my work. But, but then the signals offered by Harvard and Chicago opened up lots of doors in Stockholm as well, right. or in Sweden. Uh, so I think that in early in your, the career, I mean, both the, the influence from your peers at universities uh, are the strongest before you have informed yourself. And therefore, it's a, particularly important to be in environments with a good good academic environments. Right. Also the the probably while you're still developing, I mean then other form their opinions about you based on, on these kind of status signals, uh, more so than when you come further along your path. Right. And that's also extremely important. Mm. Now I think it it I mean if I had of course, it helped to be at Oxford, of course, particularly. I mean, but then once you've been to Oxford, I mean, if someone, I can always happen to mention that in, the, in, 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 mm. in between words so, so that people, to signal my own right. past in some ways. To, to, but otherwise, I mean, of course, the more senior you are, the, the less you need the status signals. Mm. Uh, offered by by the institution you're affiliated with. Mm, mm, mm. Um, mm. Well, that's really interesting, Peter. So that's a, and that's also something that uh, I believe you know people, especially internationals, perhaps struggle with when they come to to Sweden. Is that this you know vocation occupation contrast, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, and. Uh, so where do we stand today and what, what you know pursuing like pursuing some some work that you want to sort of excel in and become really good at i mean your your biased perspective basically <laughs> if you say biased in the sense that you have you know you have experienced this and i i, I believe uh, that you know you've, you've seen several of these especially swedish standards and american standards what would be your advice for pursuing excellence or pursuing your path to become better? Well, what, like how should, how should we think in, in that sense? Um, so I think the world is of course different and particularly the Swedish, Sweden is very different now. And, and that probably means that most of Europe is very different from, from what it was like 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so in particular that it's become so internationalized. I mean, that we, mm -hmm. I mean, when I started, I mean, we didn't have email, it didn't exist. Then came, I don't remember what it was called, the BitNet, I think, the first that came. <laughs> was, because then I remember that a professor I had at Harvard, he, he liked tech things. So he was very early on getting email. Mm -hmm. So then we could send the email to each other. And then I saw the, on the screen, yeah. Now it's reached Frankfurt. Now it has moved on to, so it moved, so I could <laughs> follow it. Uh, and, and of course, this has enabled on an entirely different scale that, yeah. that our reference groups are, are not at all, I mean, spatially bound or geographically bound uh, as, as they were. Um, Still, there are probably a few, I would say the best, I mean, if you think about really, really young people, I think that the best departments in the States or universities, I think are hard to beat in, in both that they, the quality, the, I mean, that it, the culture, it, it kind of builds into people. And also that they, typically allow longer time for, for PhD studies. I mean, that in Europe, <clears throat> uh, you usually apply at the master level, mm. and then you have four years, and you have right. to especially know before you start your PhD studies what, what 
your thesis is going to be. <clears throat> so everything that you study will not have time to affect yeah. your, while well, say at Harvard, which I think still is the case. I mean, I came in with funding from Sweden hmm. and thought I would write something comparative welfare state research was my uh, plan. And, yeah. and then even though he was not my advisor, I was very much influenced I mean, by, by Harrison White, who right. uh, was at, at the, the Harvard department at that time, mm -hmm. uh, and, and started to think, and then I kind of had enough time, six, seven years or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, I could take to finish to, well, after one and a half year of thinking that I would become a political sociologist, I could suddenly switch and, and become something else. Right. That's very hard to do, say, at Oxford or Stockholm or, or many European universities because the time is so compact. You okay. really need to be focused. So you just need to choose the right thing and then run with it. In, in these and, and even if you come to think about it, I should have chosen something else. Yeah. yeah. You don't have time to. Right, right. I mean, this is something I've, I've been thinking also a lot about as to how to, you know, take the, the good components from, say, you know, we're taking Harvard as an example because we both yeah. sort of experience being in that environment, but it could be, you know, any of those great institutions uh, around the world. So how, how do you, you know, take some of those or you know, basically take those components that you think are, are great and then plant them uh, or inject them at least in, in, a, in a system that maybe doesn't have that com competitive advantage um, for money wise or cultural wise, but how do you, and then still, you know, obviously stay healthy within the system itself because you don't want to, you don't want to inject uh, too much of imbalances, but how do you build that in, in, in say in Sweden, just to be very concrete? No, but in some ways I think that that's what happened with the Institute for Analytical Sociology. I mean, it's not very Swedish in, in any respect. Mm. Uh, the language is English, we speak English most of us. Uh, it really is um, entirely research focused, um, not uh, an international like some journals, uh, that's the main. And of course, that's typically extremely difficult to get started at a, probably any university and definitely yeah. at universities so to come in from the, from the outside. outside. Mm. Then in my case, it was that, that I just got enormous amounts of funding. I mean, so I got the, one of these advanced grants from the European Research Council. I got some huge grants from Swedish funders. So I had a extremely unusual bargaining position with, mm. with universities. Right. Um, so I could essentially play them out against each other and say that, well, if we can build this kind of institute mm. and you secure funding for at least X years, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, so I think the combination of Lots of funding, which is unusual, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and then also that that I came as a, uh, I mean, even if they didn't know really who I was or or what my research was, they could look, they could Google me and, and they could see where I've been and so on. So I came in as a guarantee also for yeah. um, that this would be something good for in this case Lynch mm -hmm. University. Nice. Uh, so in my sense, it was a bit of a that the funding environment was such that I could uh, assemble an enormous amount of research funding. That, that and then it it, it works. But of course, it's uh, we are a bit of a bubble, I would say, and the, definitely within the. Linköping University. I mean, now we're trying to to 
we're establishing more and more ties to the computer science department and lynch mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. uh, but of course we're, we're all our contacts are to place places outside yeah uh, right so, so it's basically you know secure funding and and then you know have have uh, have have the you know in a way just to sort of simplify the, the leader to actually have been trained <laughs> in, in those environments so that you know that person has has yeah. that experience so and, 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 and of course it's not the funding probably perhaps you don't need as much funding as, as i had but funding is important right um, right then it it At least, as in, I mean, how, however you have established this, I mean, so lots of credibility, I mean, from, from I think is important for mm -hmm. making universities go out of the normal blueprint and do, do something. Yeah. New. Um, and, uh, and of course, most, I mean, when, when, when you're, Then how you got it, if you got it through uh, in Sweden. Uh, and of course, there are examples of, of mm. social scientists who spent most of their life in Sweden and still managed to be, become important in the right. national yeah. So it's not a requirement to have been, mm. been abroad. And so, and so if you would take this... Uh, recipe or, or so and you would scale it up say at the university level say that you know IS is you know strong we've sort of succeeded there like well, what would be your logic of saying now we're going to take say Lean Shipping University Stockholm University and if, like what would it take to really bring up from from your mind if you would allow to speculate it's an incredibly hard question I know and there's so many components in there there's a lot of tradition and so on but what would be your main advice to someone aiming for that goal? You mean to change the, the culture? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you have, I mean, if we look at this as a, as a sport, right? So you want to create a good football team, right? Yeah, and then yeah. you want them to compete internationally yeah. with places like Harvard, you know, at, at Princeton and, and Stanford and Oxford. So what would it, you know, what would it take? Because we obviously take, we talk about internationalization and becoming excellent in, in Sweden, right? But what would it take to, to actually make that move? Um, well, my sense is that I mean, it has a lot to do with the um, leadership of the universities as well. Mm. Uh, in my sense that um, there are um, there are very good aspects, of course, to, to have. I mean, in Sweden, there is a lot of democratic consensus culture that, that uh, um, all important decisions have to be discussed in many different mm. uh, places and ideally one should find some agreement that uh, everyone is at least you know, the most, most people are, are, are happy with mm. and uh, My sense is that that's a very, it's a very nice thought, but it's a very hard way of building excellent mm. institutions. I think that, uh, I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, say, in a, just on a smaller scale, if, if the difference between having an accomplished, experienced researcher directing an institute and saying let the doctoral students do it collectively instead or, yeah. or even worse further down yeah. uh, and of course the universities there's so much inertia i mean that's not just organization not just uh, universities but but most organizations are of course there's so much inertia in it that, that uh, I think that you have to essentially start from the a strong uh, leader for the university that, that uh, 
I really someone who has credibility mm. scientifically as well, mm. and who really uses the power to reshape. Mm. Uh, because now it's yeah, it, it it it's it's very hard to. Because of course, these these universities they are huge organizations. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, Gothenburg University, fifty thousand employees. I, yeah. I believe Lean Tripping probably twenty or thirty thousand. Yeah, and of course, to steer such a coloss into something else, mm -hmm. things whatever you do can be preempted at so many places in this. Yeah. Uh, and so what would be, I mean, I, I, I think this is, but this is something, you know, we, we think about a lot in, in, in Scandinavia and countries and in general, you know, all European countries that might be also of smaller character, you know, Belgium, Netherlands and so on and so forth, where they are small, but, but wealthy countries. I, my sense is that there are financial resources, but it might be no, you know, uh, hard to assemble the cultural components of building organizations and the leadership components. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that would be looking like, but this is also what we're speculating. I mean, what would be, yeah. you know, what would be, you know, if someone would watch this, what would be the, um, you know, you said leadership from above, but so what would be the, the key principles that you would want them to implement? If you could advise them, you would be, you know, sitting on the board of, of mentors for that head of chance, vice chancellor, or what would be, you know, the right. things that you would say, maybe, maybe like two oh, or three I'm things. Good if I could do exactly what I wanted. And, and, Go for it. Go for and, it. Not, 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 not. But I mean, then I would... Uh, basically, re, re... I mean, to get... I mean, to start with, say, I mean, if you're not talking about Lynch or Shopping yeah, or whatever universal it is, yeah. I mean, to... to uh, start with building some council of the, the most established researchers mm. in the university I and mean, to have try to bring excellence into the top and into the very decision making structures mm. because now uh, the decision making is essentially done by i mean as i said before that if you want to get into above the, say the chair level within the university you're really making a choice then you build you become an administrator more or less right of course the bulk of the vast vast bulk of of uh, decision making and implementation is, is very much affected by people who at the very very early stage hmm. became more of university administrators than, than researchers hmm. and, and many of them are exceptionally good at it but but it's still uh, say if i wanted to to create move a university into much more direction of excellence yeah i really think you have to start at the top then yeah. gradually move down and, and have such ideas uh, but of course it, it's in practice yeah pra practical yeah you know, that's a that's a that's a you know that's a different beast but if i were to do it on a grand scale and then of course we have to fire a lot <laughs> of people and get other people in and, and that would clash with everything we know about of course of course it would of course it would but this is you know but this is also part of the part of the um um, for good and bad. I mean, there are certain things that, that, that we believe are good in, in, in these, these systems, and there are other things that are, are less good that you want to improve. And also, those less good things are recognized to be oftentimes less good that we maybe not publishing in the top top journals. We don't have you know, enough uh, sort of excellence in, in that, you know, in, in different, in different dimension of excellence that you don't see it as prevalent as, as you wanted to see it. And so... But it's a thought experiment that it is important to, I, I believe, for, 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 to sort of to take in and, and, and think about and a thought experiment that hopefully has some practical implication moving forward. Yeah. And so, so if we talk a little bit, maybe we move on on, 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 the, on the theme side, Peter. So if we think about you know, your, your trajectory in analytical sociology, but also beyond your scholarship has been 
the combination of working uh, uh, solo, writing these these solo books, but also in collaboration with with other uh, scholars. Uh, for example, Richard Svedberg is another established scholar. Uh, for example, your book Social Mechanisms and and others that you've collaborated on. So, what, what's your you know, what's your take on collaboration? If we now, you know, we're moving a little bit beyond the questions of, of leadership as such and more scholarship. What, what's your sense of, you know, when should you move solo? When should you collaborate? And, and what's your thought process behind that? Um, of course, the field is moving slowly towards more and more collaborative work, I think. Mm. Just like it has done in... in or has been the case in the natural sciences for a long time. Mm. But we are still um, much more than in, in other areas. I mean, looking for sole authored work as well. I mean, that it's say particularly people who have some, that has some particular skill, mm. uh, May often be in demand and may, may be uh, part of, of <coughs> author of many articles. Mm. But there's always then the uncertainty about what, um, how good is that person mm. really could. Uh, so there's always a need, I think, in the discipline. I mean, that uh, <coughs> you should. Uh, you have to have some soul authored pieces for your career. Right. Uh, then I think for me, it has been, of course, if you want to write something about your type of sociology, for example, then it almost per definition has to be your, you yourself that writes it. I mean, so, so this dissecting the social, for example, would have been. Because in some sense, it was a personal figure or, or color by my own ideas that <coughs> it would have been difficult to conceive of it, it as a right. jointly authored. Uh, otherwise, now, I mean, at the Institute, I because there we have really encouraged collaborations. Mm. <coughs> so lots of small people in different constellations work together. Mm. Uh, and I think it works both very rewarding. Uh, it's uh, um, fun, partly, and, and, and but also I think when it works, the end product gets much better than any of the collaborating people on their own could have created. So uh, uh, if you get the right kinds of constellations together, it can be. Mm -hmm. extremely productive and not just productive in the sense of doing more per unit time but, but doing something that's qualitatively better than right it would have been possible and that's sort of a combination of across you know across the within the discipline but also cross disciplines so you have you know people maybe collaborate with computer scientists and and uh, work on computer science type of, of methods and then you have other um through other disciplines, with political scientists and so on, where you, you would collaborate on more yeah. discipline-wide uh, conversations. And of course, one, one sees, perhaps to some extent in Sweden, but, but of course, to the extreme in other disciplines like, like medicine or epidemiology or so that, that where the collaboration also is a way of pushing out lots and lots of articles. You, right. you, you increase your productivity by... Uh, personally, I have never been... I mean, of course, it's, it's someone who never writes who's extremely productive. I mean, that's not much worth uh, having. Uh, but I think often being productive in the sense of publishing many things, I think sometimes is overrated. Uh, and I often think, I don't know, I may have told you that before, or I mean, there was a, a 
double bass player, a jazz player called Red Mitchell, who I think he came to Sweden as a way of <clears throat> avoiding being drafted to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And he was, a, he had worked with all the great ones and I learned to know him a bit. And then I don't remember who it was, but there was a guitar player I liked. I was very impressed by this kind of guitar wizards who could yeah. play amazing solos. Uh, and then I, I played something for Red, and he just shook on his head, and it sounds like two bad guitarists playing at the same time. <laughs> uh, a lot of that. I mean, uh, I mean, if you if you publish ten bad articles, I mean, that, that's no point in it. Uh, I mean, just, that, that's not something that should be rewarded in and of itself. I mean, so so it's uh, one has to distinguish. I mean, great if you. Perhaps if you sounded like two excellent guitar players at the same time, that, then it would be. But if you sound like two bad ones playing at the same time, <laughs> what's the point? Of it? That's, a, that's a fun. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is also a disciplinary difference, right? Between, so say, you know, epidemiology, medicine, and and uh, even some natural sciences, where you know, mathematics would probably be closer to what we we are used in sociology with solo maybe two or three you know beyond three things start to get a little too crowded yeah. and so and so this is this is also um uh, obviously a, a difference there but is there i mean th there's one thing i'm, I'm wondering here uh, peter about the uh, so uh, adam grant wrote this book uh, takers and and givers or give and take actually it's, it's the title of the book where you have um he characterizes uh, and this is collaboration in general uh, not only in social uh, discipline in academia, uh, where, where you have people that tend to uh, give more, you have people that tend to take more in collaborations, and then you have those who sort of tend to match, that, you know, you, you put in X amount, I'll, I'll be also putting in X amount, and then, you know, it's sort of a matching process in terms yeah. of how much you did. And, you, and, and so what, and when it comes to collaboration, what's your logic of thinking, like, you know, in general, not only for yourself, but also, you know, what you've experienced, maybe advice-wise, uh, how, how to think about this problem? No. No, I think one. Uh, I think I mean, in order for there to be any point with collaboration, I think one has to think of it functionally in the sense: what, what do you bring? What pieces do you bring to the puzzle? Yeah. And, 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 uh, so that that together these pieces make something bigger. Hmm. So, I mean, of course, it's in our disciplines, it's not unusual, I mean, that some person who is, is really good at, at some specific methods, you hmm. collaborate with someone who knows more about the substantive stuff that you're going to write about, or, and the third may know something about more general theoretical matters. Yeah. But then you get a constellation where the constellation and the interaction between them may indeed mm. generate something new and interesting. Yeah. That, uh, uh, while, once again, I mean, I have lots of prejudices about medicine and so on, but, but there I all had the sense that people, many people are, what did you call them, takers? I mean, that, I mean, who just wants the name on publications, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't even give anything. I mean, they, 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 they just take the, some of the credits from the publication. And, uh, uh, but I think that Uh, usually, I would say these kind of complementary skills, mm. uh, rather than having say, d duplicating skills and that people with similar skill sets, uh, then it, of course you can you can divide up labor and perhaps be more productive. Yeah, like that. But if you want to say something new or unusual, I think it's the combination of of mm. ideas from different areas. And, right. So it's basically trying to, uh, I mean, in a way, it sounds like more of a matching or giving behavior, giving in the sense that you're giving to this collective of of a new entity, a new emergent entity yeah. of an idea that you are 
pursuing or, or matching in the sense that you have a puzzle that you're trying to solve and you, you match the yeah. complementary skills. And, and in, in your sense, to what extent does this sort of play out, you know, through your career, um, you know, where, where you have, um, but it could also be, you know, it could also be that you, you thought someone would contribute, you know, this to this little oh, piece, yeah. but it didn't work out. And so what's, yeah. you know, and then that might generate conflict. And so what, that would be another way where this sort of trinity of takers, givers and matchers play in. And of course your role changes over your career. And That's you a week now. Uh, forced to be givers early on in the career and even be, being givers to takers anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, being forced to, I mean, which I, I'm not going to go into any details, but I mean, early on writing together with someone who was much more senior and, and who had lots of different or strange ideas about what we should write. But then, of course, as a young graduate student at that time, I mean, felt forced to, in the end, anyhow, accept, uh, because otherwise there would have been a tremendous conflict and yeah. that was not really <laughs> worth taking at that point in time. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the, the critical. Uh, dimension, if you like, of, of academic life, but also I, I would say any life, any social life, it, it involves, you know, if you're in family life, you know, there's a problem of giving and taking and matching and so on, you know, I did the dishes yesterday, now you have to do the dishes, and those, those chores, and this, it could you know, come through in, in, in academic work. In, but do you have like a, do you, do you try to calibrate expectations before or throughout or afterwards? Or like, how do you, you know, if you would give advice to Maybe more junior researchers and maybe mid-career researchers have to how to how to alleviate <laughs> these. No, 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 no. But I mean, I guess I mean nowadays when I collaborate with people, we're very you know, already in the stage of deciding what to write. We decide who is going to do what. Uh, yeah. At least the kind of first stage. Uh, <clears throat> Um, probably for, for really junior people it's very important I think also to try to set those make those decisions explicit early on mm. um, so that otherwise they're going to end up doing much more of the work than, than, than uh, uh, I mean to set the the, mm. <coughs> the limits for yeah. Uh, and to, but also, I mean, this to, to yeah, early on try to yeah. write some things on their own, uh, to, um, I don't know if that's the case anymore, but I, I remember or previously, I think also it was at least not unimportant to not only to signal your independence and your own ability, but also to signal your commitment to sociology as, as a, that you are indeed a real sociologist. Right. <laughs> and, uh, it may have been a bad advice, but I remember that I once gave a person advice that I, because he had written, he was about my age, but I, and I had written lots of very applied texts about various kinds of social problems. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling him that People never going to take you seriously as a sociologist unless you write something that is truly important only for sociologists. <laughs> yeah. And then I think, I don't know if you have read it, which I think is one of Andrew Abbott's best articles I mean, that he published in AGS for many, many years ago called the Status Crystallization of Profession. Right. right. 
where it goes through different professions and those that get high status within the discipline, mm. usually those that have the lowest status outside the discipline, <laughs> or, or the, who are valued the least. Yeah, right. right. The, the, um, your regular MD who sits all days and meets patients, it's of course very much appreciated by the public, mm. but has nil status in the in the medical professional hierarchy. Right. And uh, while and, and that, at least according to Abbott, I mean his idea was that the less you get your hands dirty with the real stuff of the world, uh, the more status you can get. And he had lots of examples on from s surgeons who come in and then, and then they go out again. I mean, they just barely want to touch the body. They, they make their few things, and then they are the, the, the giants of the... Uh, and of course, that's an exaggeration, but I think that yeah. by writing and doing some work that signals your, your commitment mm. to the discipline or to the, the group that you're part of mm. uh, can be well, yeah, if you can do it yeah, yeah. do it well then then it's uh, it can have a, lots of impact on yeah. your, how and, you're perceived by others and thereby for your career right I mean this this actually leads me to, to another you know, sort of a, a set of questions of, of several of us that are doing work, say, in computational social science, especially, I would say, computational social science, maybe less so in analytical sociology, where you have more of a clear commitment to the program of, of analytical sociology. And it's, it's a hard balance. I mean, I, I can recognize myself in it starting up more in theory, meta theory, and then going more into applied research. It's, it's actually a hard balance because you, you go into computational sort of sciences, the more general field, there's a lot of exciting things going on, but it's hard to, as you say, uh, uh, sort of uh, re, um, basically uh, uh, sort of draw benefit from that endeavor of going outside for your original community that might be, you know, sociology. Yeah. And so what, you know, especially today when we stand in this very interdisciplinary world, and also the institute, you know, has uh, has a bit of, of that profile. Mm, you know, how, how do you not go lost? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer to it, but um, but I uh, no, it's very easily because, of course, the the parts of the as you know more much more. Of, about than I do, but I mean the parts of the machine learning methods and so on are, of course, like black boxes. I mean, which it, uh, I mean, you know that it can, you can train it so that it can predict stuff. Mm. Uh, but so on the one hand, having a theory that or or a, an ambition that theories should remove all black boxes and making all the mechanisms transparent mm. and then adopting a data analytic strategy that really is much more opaque of what's, what's happening than mm. traditional methods. Of course, there is a tension yeah. between there. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's unsolvable and I think I think what I like about computational social science, of course, also that it suddenly allows us to start to use other data sources yeah. uh, to a much higher degree. I mean, mm -hmm. Spatial images, right. brain images, right. <coughs> text, and so on. Yeah. Uh, we're just at the beginning of that, is my sense, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very, very promising for all of sociology. And <coughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, but this is this is the 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 hard, you know, the hardness of, of the task. I mean, for example, if you're in economics, there's a clear commitment to to the disciplinary program. Oftentimes, yeah. it's it's the, the disciplinary whip is harder if you're yeah. outside or inside. 
Uh, in sociology, it's more fragmented, obviously, but then you have disciplinary whips maybe in sub-discipline, subgroups, like there's a clear sort of signal on if you're in or out of, of the group. You know, we talked about INS. If you go to INS, if you go, you know, part of, of that or other, other um, organizations. And so, but this is, you know, this also sort of leads me to another uh, maybe, you know, sense for you learning, like learning through your career, Peter. I mean, you have... You start off a lot in theory, but you've also, you know, gone gone into the social network theories and your base modeling, and, and now you know there's machine learning and and and, and causal inference and statistical flavor. So for you, learning, Peter, I mean, learn, learning really like learning as a you say you're the student mentality, learning new things versus collaboration, and this has obviously changed through your career, throughout your career, how much you would learn versus collaborate. But what's, you know, what's your like, principles of when you should engage in learning versus collaboration? I'm not sure that I would think of them as being necessarily in opposition to yeah. each other. Of course, learning, certain types of learning would, of course, be in opposition because yeah. Yeah. that you close the door and... Right, say learning for specialization, like learning to really, you know, go into the depth. L learning in general, we do, but but learning for specialization. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know if I, I have any real advice there. I think you, at least I myself, have a feeling that I that has been driven in some ways by my intellectual or research interests. So, I mean, if, 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 if my research interests have come to a point that I have identified this is something I need to learn more about, yeah. then I have closed the door and tried to learn more about it. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes it's just a small thing, sometimes a big thing. Mm. Uh, To do that on a grand scale, I mean, then, then you have to have a good employment situation. I mean, <laughs> if you teach a lot at the same time, or so you, you, I mean, your time constraints are so much more demanding than, than <clears throat> what I've had for a long time now. Um, but I think that the whether you learn through discipline studies on your own or or if you learn new things mainly by in your collaboration with others who know those things mm. <clears throat> um, if you're not curious about learning new things you probably have lost it as a good right. I mean if right. you uh, either you have yeah, lost your curiosity or, or you have, have some mistaken beliefs of, of already having the answers to all important questions. And right. Neither right. of those are, are conducive for <laughs> for research. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could also be, you know, the, the over specialization that you become this, say, I don't know, methodologist that you've learned this, you know, very important method and then you're only yeah. hammering that method. Yeah. And so you end up, you know, doing that or, you know, you know, the theory very, very well. So you yeah. end up doing doing that that part but then you i would say you know you might over specialize maybe or or but then there might be hard there might be reasons or benefits uh, uh, sort of to do that but but also you're saying i think in general to be a good rounded researcher you probably need um you know to be curious <laughs> in different dimensions not only one one dimension and i think that now we of course don't know where the computational social science field is moving. Is it going to be, is it going to become a, almost like some kind of discipline at universities? Well, perhaps not, but, mm. um, but otherwise, I mean, to the extent that um, a young person is going to have to be hired in the sociology department, mm. uh, even if they are, are you know, the decisions of other types of sociologists are going to be important for that person. Right. I think with, <clears throat> which I can also feel, I mean, with, or I've felt 
at different parts of my career that some doubts about I mean, some people who have been methodologists who who uh, I mean are really good at by our standards are mm. good at methods, mm. but who are become exclusively methods people. Mm. And the doubt can be, would they stand a chance of getting a good position in a statistics department? Mm. Probably not. No, yeah. They are, they are really good by our <coughs> standards. Mm. But as long as they don't do any sociology in, in some ways, they are only methodologists. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's hard for 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 sociologists to judge the merits of. of I can judge the, their usefulness. Yeah, yeah. For teaching courses for for uh, collaborating with. <coughs> but how good are they really in relation to the best people yeah. doing that kind of work? And. and and this this contrasts uh, really nicely with um, I would say in, in economics again, where you have you know econometricians. They they are, I mean, they are the high priests of the discipline. <laughs> oftentimes, yeah. they but they have their own sub discipline and established such. I mean, they aren't often they go in and out between the statistics departments and and economics departments or mathematics. Um, but but they are it's a different it's a different sub discipline which we don't have the same flavor in sociology would we have you know if we would have that you know then you could say would they you know would they be able to compete with the statistician well then you know then if, if the answer is yes then they're really you know then they're really interdisciplinary in the, in the, in the overlap between oh, yeah. no. statistics and 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 um and the discipline but we don't really have that for for good and bad i, I would say in, in sociology uh, so so peter we we are we are reaching soon the the end of, of this interview, but but uh, but you know no interview is, is finished until we hear a little bit about your micro strategies. So you know a sort of an average day in, in Peter's you know in Peter's uh, uh, life, and obviously the average you know today compared to the average when you were at, at Oxford with yeah. with you know total freedom and so on. Uh, but but if you would you know maybe maybe you know may, maybe talking about the the idealized average of, of Peter. What would like a perfect, you know, day or maybe an average day? Not perfect. Perfect is always yeah. idealized. <laughs> over, over, not over idealized. And then they have the week and, and, the, and the month. Like, how do you arrange your days? How do you arrange so that you get maximum benefit for writing and thinking and going deep versus, yeah. you know, doing a bit more shallow work, maybe answering emails and so on? Yeah. yeah. No, no, of course it gets. Uh, yeah, I'm probably not well organized enough to be a role model for anyone else. I, think. <laughs> uh, I mean, particularly with, with emails and so that one obviously should uh, control. I remember I, I don't know if you know the economist Ash Fehr, who, who uh, we've talked about in one, and he had exactly the same problem that or gets enormous lots of email mm. and uh, just find it impossible to resist looking at them. <laughs> he had some, I finally got an app that shut down. I mean, so he, he, he wasn't able to oh, basically open mail for, mm. except for certain hours. So right. But I think that's because most serious thinking and writing, then you need uninterrupted time. Mm. And uh, it's very easy to, to be distracted. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and also I think that mine is probably a bit atypical that I've had research, pos more or less full-time research positions for such a big part of my career that uh, I have rarely had to be able to build, I mean, to compromise around teaching and so on, which of course makes a big, big, big difference. Mm -hmm. but, but for me, it's, 
Ja, och så då. Yeah, so yeah, you have to do it all somehow. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know. I, I perhaps I've been a bit lucky. I remember that there was a. Yeah, he must be dead by now, I guess. A very famous political scientist at Yale, Robert Dahl. Mm -hmm. who, uh, I think it was in relation to when public choice started to be important in politics. And then he, I think he, I don't remember the exact title, but it was politics as muddling through. He meant that, well, politics is not the, the rational decision makers who sit on opposite mm. sides, mm. but it really is a muddling through, you, you kind of often much shorter horizons, you handle problems, you move on, and somehow you uh, <laughs> move in the right direction. Anyhow. And sometimes I have a little bit that sense that characterized my life as well, that I... Uh, But probably it's more, I mean, I know what, what needs to be done. You have to have time to read. You have to have time to, to, uh, to write, to do research, etc. Yeah. And there is no constancy, I think, in, in how I organize my days. Mm. But I'm aware of that if I have set one of those things aside too long, well, then, then that calls on my attention so then that becomes the focal point and then it moves <laughs> muddling through the world <laughs> muddling through that's a that's a good that's a good characterization i mean you know but i personally i've tried several tactics where i try to like i'm going to work in the mornings and then you know and then but maybe certain days and then that doesn't work certain reasons and and so it's 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 hard to <laughs> it's really muddling through is a good concept, but but it's not. But, but I remember, like, uh, yeah, you mentioned him before, Richard Svedberg. I mean, at least when we were in Stockholm, I mean, then he was very disciplined. I mean, so he, if I remember correctly, he, he started working seven o'clock in the morning, or even if it was six, worked until about 10 or 11, and that's when he did his serious academic work. Then he came, and that he did from home. Then he came out to the university for lunch, and then he could go around being social and talk to people. And, uh, and I think that, I mean, who was at uh, Harvard at the time when I was there, Athena Scotchball, that she had some similar. Uh, I mean, so she was also up early in the morning, mm. did essentially all the research reading yeah. in the morning then came in did some teaching talking to uh, some of i wish perhaps like i i would have been so well organized but but, uh, but you but you have are you are you a morning morning person peter are you, are you waking up in the morning Probably not <laughs> <laughs> more late 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 uh, yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're, yeah, yeah. burning the, the midnight uh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, the I think, uh, yeah. I guess the important thing is th is to find time for all those things, yeah. and then of course uh, at certain points in time. I mean, if you're going to do lots of writing or so, I mean, you have to have space and calm around you to to be yeah. able to do that uh, and to. Uh, Reading I can do in many different uh, environments. Writing, I think, I need much more peacefulness and quietness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, writing is more of an active act, so it needs it needs even more quietness uh -huh. to, to yeah. do the work, right? So, so it's a and, and you you try to you have a certain. Uh, I mean, this is very hard, but I find it quite hard to find time to read beyond just reading for the sake of paper A, a or B or C that I'm writing on. You have like you have a golden ratio of you know writing versus so, reading. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, that's of course what has suffered now. I mean, with say building the institute mm -hmm. and so on, because that takes uh, it takes time to be, mm -hmm. to build the institutions. Yeah. And, and I think that what what's easiest to give up on is then, of course, all the reading of the not 
yeah. really instrumental kind. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that has suffered for me also. I mean, with, with yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are these are obviously trade offs that needs to be needs to be made in in order to sort of uh, carve out time for something something new. Uh, so, Peter, we are really at the end of, of the last theme. It's a, it's a small set of questions, but it's, it's, it's all about, you know, you have sort of achieved uh, much in, in your career. You've you walked through different institutions, uh, um, in different continents, uh, and, you know, you've landed a, a lot of research funding. You've written a, a lot of book that people, books that people care about, articles that people read. And, and so, you know, basically, you know, what... What goals have you not achieved yet? What do you wish <laughs> that you could achieve? And, and hopefully, you know, you'll have another you know, prosperous uh, decades, many decades to go. And so what would you wish, you know, you could, you could still uh, achieve? I think the, I mean, I have more tangible short-term goals. I mean, I'm, uh, I mean, which is more personal to me. I mean, with securing the future of the Institute, uh, um, writing another book, uh, one of the articles that we are working on now, I have a very high hopes for to hopefully get into one of the top journals. Mm. Um, but uh, otherwise, of course, I find the most exciting stuff going on now is around computational social science. Mm -hmm. uh, my guess, I will not be, uh, I mean, obviously I will not be a methodological contributor to that field, but it's something that I find extremely interesting, actually. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> as I said before, we're just in the beginning, so we don't know. <clears throat> where this will take us, but I can see I mean, both with your stuff and with other people at the Institute who are, are uh, doing text analysis of, of, and, and it really opens up access to, to data sources that in some ways are more natural. I mean, I mean the uh, we don't have to do surveys, and, and, and but, but we can take the raw material from text, from, mm -hmm. from imagery, and, <clears throat> and that I find, and particularly, I mean, which I have always found so disturbing throughout my sociological career, that our theories are almost exclusively about social interactions and, mm -hmm. and, and how interactions between individuals form who they are, how they perceive themselves, what kind of collective outcomes they jointly bring about and so on. Mm -hmm. But the dominant type of data has always been, uh, I mean, either small intensive detailed studies of very, very small groups mm -hmm. uh, or survey data where you kind of pick one individual here, another here. And so this has always been an absolute mismatch between what I would think of the core of sociology theoretically mm. and the core type of empirical research that has been done. But now with, with CSS, we finally start to get data on large groups of, of interacting individuals and, and uh, then perhaps the, the things they do are not the kind of things we would study in the first place and I think that finally we start to uh, yeah. so I know that it was actually Mark Koichnig who, who came up with it in, in that it's always that the CSS methods have the promise of a sociological kind of empirical research on par with what econometrics have provided for, for, for economics. Right. That's because the, the, we have the, the 
we can study in detail the interactions, follow that over time, we can study mm. huge populations mm. over long periods of time. So, mm. then, uh, so from a And I think that's in some ways the biggest thing that has happened in social science right. for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So I said, sometimes we don't know quite yet where it's going to take us, but it's it's a fascinating development, particularly for sociology. I right, right, right. I mean, I think I think this is this is like. Uh... A crossroad in terms of where we stand and the wealth of data that has or is being generated and and new types of, of data that 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 could be that could be used in, in, in many many different ways so it's, it sounds like you know in your sort of uh, the, the question what goals that you wish you know you want to still achieve would be to to do more in this uh, in this area of of the computational social science field and perhaps an adjacency to theory uh, uh overlap right or, or, or development because there's still a mismatch as as far as 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 you know you've written and, and others have, have written in this in this field yeah. and, and so you know peter if, if you would uh, you know if you would um uh, want to maybe say the, the following that you know in terms of your legacy i mean hopefully you have many many more again decades to give what, what would that you know if you would say like hopefully if you could wish you know people summarizing what peter Hisram uh as done i mean if you would speculate what would you know what would that be in, in, a, in a sentence or two or, or three well, uh, probably the things that i hard question but uh, some aspects of it at least would be it'd be uh, insistence on say clarity, precision, explicit explanations uh, to uh, study processes as they unfold uh, mm. and I mean as to linking micro and macro uh, right. in, in data wise as well as um, theory-wise, mm -hmm. being very clear about all your concepts, about how things hang around, tag together, uh, so it's time of moving, making perhaps sociological theory less evocative but also less sloppy in some ways <laughs> <laughs> making more precise and perhaps by making certain things only sound interesting if they are vaguely expressed perhaps in, in certain sociological theories so that once you start to clarify it loses some of its mystery and appeal perhaps but 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 in some ways that the Clarity, precision, mm -hmm. uh, focus on explanations rather than descriptions, mm -hmm. um, and explanations that, that link mm -hmm. individual behavior to collective right. problems. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah, a contributed to the pushing sociology in that direction. <laughs> I remember for that, I would be very happy. I think I think that you know that will, that's an excellent s summary of, of where you uh, where, where you stand, Peter. I mean, you have. As, you know, as far as uh, the, the work that you have done and, and people are reading your work and, and, and it's really leading towards that path, more, more of that in, in the discipline that we are in. And so you get the final question now, or maybe encouragement here. If, if you would want to encourage people, uh, listeners to, to maybe a challenge, maybe encouragement, maybe a question, what would that be to the, for the audience? What would you wish them to see, to, to do more if you would meet them, you know, a year or two from now? Well, probably I would, depends on who the audience is, <laughs> but, but, but say if, if it's more and more on the, I don't know, I mean, to embrace, to learn more of, of CSS, I mean, I think that's a, a 
incredibly wise investment these days. Mm. Uh, to uh, personally, I have also found it useful to. I mean, if I mean, some of my dissecting the social, at least the idea was to start from basic ideas about what characterizes a good explanation. And then from that, try to derive what implications that has for what kind of theories should we want and how can empirical research fit in, into that. Mm. And at that very first part in some ways to think about what, when we explain something, what do we do? I have found quite a lot of, of say, the philosophy of science literature mm. stimulating and interesting and, and perhaps I have a combination of reading some of that basic philosophical philosophy of science literature combined with computational social science very far apart from each other yeah. but that's what we have to merge together I think for the future. That's a that's a, a great challenge Peter and I, I'm sure we have people in the audience that will take up your challenge and, and who knows, you know, a year or two from now, there'll be papers appearing in the top journals that would have not been appear, appearing because... Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> if, they hadn't, if they hadn't listened to this interview. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's the ultimate kind of factual question. Yeah. Peter, uh, I thank you very much for, for your time. It thank has you. been a true pleasure to have you on the show and, and listen to your, uh, you know, your, your history, your trajectory through through life, through academia. And uh, I, you know, I, I hope that, uh, I'm sure that the listeners that will uh, watch this uh, will learn a lot. So I, I have certainly done, so. It was a real pleasure for me as well. It was fun, fun talking to you and interesting. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.